Now at five, could the Portland metro area be turning a corner when it comes to homelessness? Why some people say new numbers don't tell the whole story. Plus, Vancouver's plan to turn a gym into a shelter that some say is badly needed. And later, history in the making. On the final night of the DNC, we hear from local delegates in Chicago ahead of Kamala Harris's big moment. Thank you for joining us here at 5. I'm Christine Bidawanich. And I'm David Molko. We begin with a new report that finds more people in Multnomah County are making their way into temporary housing that is with ongoing efforts in Portland and beyond to develop more shelter space. We have live team coverage this evening with Sydney Dorner looking at a new proposal in Clark County. But first to our Blair Best with that progress report. Blair. Multnomah County just released a new report showing the number of people they got off the streets and into housing in the past year. And while the numbers seem encouraging, it's no secret that the homeless crisis continues to impact neighborhoods across our city. One could say Multnomah County is turning a corner on housing. Multnomah County is on track. Uh, we're pointed in the right direction. A recent county report shows more than 5,000 homeless people moved into permanent housing in the past year, with more than 7,000 entering shelter. Dan Field leads the county and city's joint office of homeless services. We're seeing more people move into shelter than ever before. We're seeing people move into permanent housing, and we need to build on that success. And it's all thanks to taxpayer dollars. You may have heard of the Supportive Housing Services Tax, which allocated millions of dollars to address homelessness. For the first time in recent years, the county found a way to spend it all. And it took us a few years to, to ramp up um, the work and get to a point where we can confidently and most importantly, effectively spend the dollars that the taxpayers are trusting us with. That includes funding the team at Do Good Multnomah. They run more than a dozen programs, including tiny home villages and street outreach. Without the, these funds, I, I can't even imagine where we'd be at as a city. Yet as the county touts success, neighborhoods across Portland fight the crisis on their own. It's been a very challenging summer for us on this block in particular. Isaac Schmidt lives off Southeast Hawthorne Boulevard. These signs are an effort to deter homeless camps. Almost every day for the past two months we've had open drug use. So we come out of the house and you can smell fentanyl in the air. There's a lot more to this homelessness than you realize. Pam is one of the homeless people staying in Isaac's neighborhood. I know there's a lot of us out here that would like to get help. But shelter for people like her, she says, is hard to find. You need to be referred, and to get a referral, if you're like me and you're new and you don't, haven't been homeless a long time, you don't just know this stuff. And it wears on her. When you're having to do your meals and, I'm going to start crying, to bathe and to, it's really hard, you know. We know there's still a crisis on our streets and our communities of homelessness, and uh, this is really just a, a progress report, not a final report. A lot of work ahead of us. All right, so you heard it there. The county is calling this a progress report and acknowledging that there's more work that needs to be done. For example, out of all the people they housed this past year, more than 80% stayed in housing. It has for that 10, 12% that went back to the streets. Well, that just speaks to the complexity of this issue and the need for more complex solutions. David, Christine. Yeah, insightful report there. Thank you so much, Blair Best in downtown Portland for us. All right, let's bring in Sydney Dorner now, who's looking at efforts to grow shelter space in Vancouver. Sydney. David, the city has already planned to purchase the old gymnasium, famous for training uh, athletes like Olympian Jordan Childs. We wanted to get community feedback to, to decide what they would use it for. The city estimates around 500 people are unhoused across Vancouver with no space at any of their tiny homes or shelters. From now until the end of November, the community will have virtual and in-person opportunities to express any concerns about turning the property into a homeless shelter. But residents living close by don't seem too happy. We're planning for a medication assisted treatment program embedded, like integrated in the shelter. Um, we That kind of service exists in the community, but not necessarily on site with people who are experiencing homelessness. Absolutely not. Well, already we see trash from the homeless so park, camping out over here by on the other side of the park, right north of where they're putting that. The city says if they go forward with this large homeless shelter, it will cost them about $6 million to $7 million to run a year. Christine, David. 
Yeah, still a work in progress there. Thank you, Sydney. Sydney Dorner in Vancouver. Meanwhile, staying in Clark County, State Route 14 is back open this evening after a crash on a bridge in Camas around noon closed the highway in both directions. Washdot says a manufactured home being transported on a flatbed got stuck trying to cross the bridge, blocking traffic between Camas and Washougal for a few hours there. Both eastbound and westbound have reopened. In Cowlitz County, the coroner's office has identified the remains of a man found dead earlier this year. He was found in early May in a wooded area off Old Pacific Highway South in Kelso. Investigators say they used DNA to identify him as 21-year-old Miguel Lara Camacho of Pennsylvania. He was living in Longview when he went missing about a year ago. We still do not know how he died. And scary moments last night when an apartment tower in southeast Portland's Selwood neighborhood caught fire. Three people were forced from their homes. Crews say it sparked around 8 o'clock on a fifth floor balcony, then spread to three more floors. Firefighters put the fire out within 30 or so minutes. Fortunately, no one was hurt. No word on the cause. New at 5, the Lebanon Fire District is making changes amidst ongoing challenges in our region around ambulance response times. The district is cutting what it calls single role ambulances from two full time positions down to a single half time position. Those are units that just have EMTs or paramedics rather than dual role providers, which are also trained as firefighters. Officials say this is because of funding and the challenges of recruiting qualified candidates. It says the changes are needed to ensure 911 medical services can continue. It is a busy week across the Portland metro area as students and families get ready to head back to school. It feels like summer just went by just like that. All right, that includes staff in Oregon's biggest school district with teachers returning yesterday to prepare for next week. And this afternoon, we got to talk with Portland Public's brand new superintendent, Dr. Kimberly Armstrong, who came from Vancouver's Evergreen District. Armstrong says despite the challenges PBS faces, including in the aftermath of last year's teacher strike, she has confidence in the quality of its programs. I want parents to know that we can prepare our students for a lifetime of learning and um, help them move into whatever they envision for themselves. The first day of school for most students in Portland is next Tuesday with the remainder returning on Wednesday. We spoke with Dr. Armstrong and we also discussed issues like funding, student absenteeism, post pandemic learning loss and cell phones in the classroom. We'll post some of the highlights of our interview on KGW.com. Now to the final night of the Democratic National Convention. This is a live look inside the United Center in Chicago. Tonight, Vice President Kamala Harris is the headliner and is set to make history. Well, let's bring in John Adams. He's been talking to local delegates inside that convention hall. John, there's a lot of buzz around Harris's speech tonight. What are you hearing? Well, the delegates told me that the atmosphere inside the United Center has been just electric this week, and the parties really come together behind Vice President Harris, especially after President Biden dropped out of the race just one month ago. Tanisha Harris is a Democratic delegate from Clark County who has spent the week at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. Harris described what it's been like inside the United Center. There's this energy and vibe that I never, I haven't seen since. 2008. Harris points to speeches by the Obamas, President Joe Biden and Minnesota Governor Tim Walls as highlights of the week thus far, especially the moment between Walls and his children. If you're watching that last night and you were not moved by this young man's reaction saying that's my father and then looking down at his sister saying that's our father, something's wrong with you. Senator Ron Wyden has also been in Chicago this week and says he's never seen the energy higher with young people in the party. I have never seen this kind of excitement. This is an exciting time for young people, we're saying. We want to lower the cost of education. We want to make sure we can make our own health care choices. We want to be in a position someday to own a home. Those are the kinds of things that the vice president is talking about, and I believe that's why she's going to win. Vice President Kamala Harris will take the stage to wrap the convention Thursday night. For those people who are wondering who she is, you know, even though she has been our vice president for three and a half years and she was, you know, a senator and attorney general, she's going to introduce herself really to America and to the world, really. Yeah, a lot of pressure introducing herself to the word. I'm curious here, uh, what does Tanisha Harris say about the evolution of the ticket here from, from Biden to Harris over the last month? 
Well, she said she was a staunch supporter of the Biden Harris ticket and was going to support uh, Biden all the way till the uh, election day in November. But uh, after that debate on June 27th became a little concerned because some people in the party uh, were becoming concerned about Biden's age. But she's very excited that people have really uh, come together behind the vice president uh, since Biden dropped out of the race. Appreciate your reporting on this, John. And because of the DNC, we also want to let you know about a bit of a programming reminder here. We will not be having a 6 p.m. newscast, nor will we have the story or the good stuff. Instead, join us for a very special edition new newscast at 9 o'clock or whenever the convention ends, really. <laughs> 55 last, last night. night. <laughs> yeah. Then we'll recap the night during KGW News at 11. All right. It's straight ahead on KGW News at 5. The, it's move-in day, rather, at the University of Portland. We're going to hear from students preparing for a brand new chapter and later how the Blazers plan to honor legend Bill Walton this season and we're tracking some rain headed into our area this Thursday night into tomorrow but it hasn't hit the Rose City just yet here's a look from our Wells Fargo camera right now those clouds really hanging on to the entirety of Western Oregon all the way up into Washington heavy again over the Cascades as well so we'll talk more about what we can expect in terms of rain some chances for thunderstorms over the Cascades that's coming up in your seven day forecast.